We'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. So um, first of all, thanks a lot for making time. And as you pointed out, Trina, it's, it's a lot of uh, people that uh, we already know. The content, in my opinion, is, is what's most important because it lives on and it's able to impact the most. So my name is uh, Francisco Leja. I'm coming to you from uh, New York City. I'm going to be your moderator uh, for, for this session. And joining me is uh, Michelle Cabrera Caruso and Mac McFarland, as formerly Robert Mac McFarland, but Mac uh, as he is known in uh, close circles. And so uh, probably the first thing you should know about uh, this panel is I am very nervous because no, <laughs> because Michelle is typically the moderator uh, amongst uh, many leaders in the financial world and presidents and governments. Um, so this is uh, the first time that I asked her to be a panelist as opposed to a moderator so that we could actually explore her life and her career along the way. And the reason I asked Mac to join us is because he has a completely distinct path in his career, being in the Navy on active duty, and as we'll discuss, many of the challenges to navigate for both of them to be able to rise to the top. And so I'll start by telling you, before I give the formal introductions of them, I'll start by telling you that how this came to be is Cordell called and said, hey, I, you know, you're, you're Mr. Leadership, you've done this for, for, for some time, and I would love to have something that is prescriptive um, in, an, in an ability to be able to impact the most for the folks that come to our festival. And I gave it some thought and, you know, I started exploring on different ideas for leadership, but the most important piece was the fact that both of the people that you'll hear about today come from completely different backgrounds, have complete different ethnic ties, in completely different sectors, but I'm sure as we, we explore the, their lives, we'll be able to understand the principles that have led them to be able to navigate to the very top of their organizations. And so I'm really excited to, to get through the panel and be able to explore all of those great issues. So I'll, I'll start by introducing my friend Mac. <laughs> so Mac uh, was born in Detroit and uh, was raised in Colorado. He is currently on active duty for the United States Navy and most importantly, has been selected for 06 Major Command, which we'll, we'll, we'll explore this a little bit to be able to understand this, but it is very few people on active duty that are able to make the bench of 05 level command. And when you make 06 level command, that's essentially the bench, select admirals and generals for each one of the services. And so I just, I just wanna point that out. The, He's currently serving uh, in Washington, D.C., in the Pentagon, um, and he's he's going to take command of his ship uh, within the year, right? Which, That's right, later this year. Yeah, which which means, to put it in layman's term, right, all of us, I'm sure all of us have seen Top Gun, right, and you see, <laughs> you see all, so he's going to have the charge not only of the mission for those ships and everything that is associated there, but also the livelihoods of the people with him and the families of those people that he has under his command. So I'm sure that he, he is in deep reflection during this time frame as he assumes that mantle and once, once it comes, it's gonna be extraordinary. We met through uh, the White House Fellowship Program where we both serve on the National Recruitment Committee. And more importantly, we were separated uh, by one year in class. So we're still arguing on who's the better class, but I think maybe I'll concede today <laughs> and say that his class is better, they, they're, they're stronger friends. But uh, on, on, his, on his pastime, and this is also important, he finds time to be very passionate and volunteer with uh, any type of youth intervention programs, which for most of you here in the audience, the great thing about being an ambassador of different things, much like this festival, is you get to explain to folks that don't live that life. Being on active duty is 100% expectation that you are committed to just that profession. There is no room to moonlight, there's a, there, it's very difficult, but Mac has found a way, which is, I'm very impressed and, and very happy to call him friend. He's found a way to be able to volunteer time for youth intervention as a big brother, big sister program. And he's also gotten involved in his own private capacity for buying businesses for people of color and being able to sell them in the real estate world. And to do that and succeed to the bench of becoming an admiral as an African American male in the oldest service that we have, and, and quite, quite true, I'm an Army veteran myself, but I can tell you that the Navy is the most formal. To be able to do all of that and still keep the smile, I'm proud to call him friend. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Frank. 
Now, Michelle, as, as I mentioned, um, has an extraordinary background. Um, we met through the Latino Corporate Directors Association. Um, she, I, I know the, the, the background, you know, I'll mix it in back and forth, but we met because she was hosting uh, an event at the Ballet Hispanico. And um, that's something that is very near to where, where I was uh, spent the last 20 years. And most importantly, as, as we met, I didn't do my homework. Uh, she's the host, and all I could notice is that the food at this nice event is from Wendy's. So I'm just, you know, I'm puzzled. And, <laughs> and so I'm puzzled, and I, I say, oh, you're the host. Thanks for hosting us. Why, do, why are we eating Wendy's food? And she's like, I, I've just been appointed to the board, right? So I said, oh, okay. So I, I started, you know, I started slowly, like, you know, digesting that. And then as I got to know her, I really started to understand how uh, her career and I want, and again, much like uh, Mac, the reason she's here is her background. She she uh, comes from New Hampshire. She's Cuban America. She started off uh, being a correspondent and then moved into the financial market segments. She was the first Latina anchor at CNBC and international correspondent. Right. <laughs> and in our community, we can understand how difficult it must have been for a Cuban American. That's a woman, sorry, I'm putting that in there, to be able to crack the code on a male dominated, you know, business in Wall Street. Not, not today when we're moving forward and everybody wants to help you out, but decades ago. Okay. That was significant. I mean, I, I enjoy having our private conversations, which I'm sure we're going to get to today on being able to explore those principles to navigate there. So, uh, she's also, she does a, a lot of other things. She, she's a full uh, member of uh, the CFR council. She's also on the board of advisory for one of the most prestigious universities and business school in Spain. Um, and she's, she also holds a couple of other corporate uh, directorships. So please help me welcome Michelle Cabrera Cruz. Okay, you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, I wanted to frame uh, the session explicitly because of the opening remarks uh, that Cordell mentioned, which if you didn't get a chance to, to attend, it was really powerful and punky when he started talking about the avatar, because most of, again, we all know each other, and most of us agree that there's something special about the festival, right? And we attend a lot of conferences, but here it seems that people let their guard down. It seems that we're able to make personal, you know, relationships and friendships that, that last. And so when I started thinking about that, I wanted, uh, I, we initially had four folks, we, 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 we got to, and I really wanted to explore this such in a very, uh, in a very private manner and uh, in a manner where we could be able to really learn. So on, on that note, for bo both of my uh, participants here, I wanted to frame the situation in terms of careers. So my observation is that you could probably, I like to book in things. So I could probably say that we could book in multiple chapters in our careers, but for, for my panelists, I'd like to book in it with two chapters you know, your first chapter that got you to the middle, and then your next chapter that got you to the top. So I'll start with Mac. If you could go ahead and share with us some of the principles and, and mental models that you use to be able to navigate both of those chapters. So first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It is a special place. This is my first time at the festival, and it's so great to be with so many wonderful people from such diverse backgrounds. Thank you for that incredible uh, intro. So I think the way that I look at my career, if you want to read it, is, is kind of the initial chapter one, what I would say the first couple of years, maybe two to three kind of years where you're just trying to kind of take a bearing, trying to figure out what's going on. I think we have to really acknowledge, especially from communities of color, we are oftentimes entering spaces where we're not uh, aware of the, the unspoken rules. And we should acknowledge that because it's going to take us time. Also, a lot of times when we're starting out right after college or in a new career, we don't know what's going on. And sometimes we're very excited and we really, really want to shoot for the top. But really what we need to do is kind of establish our bearings, develop a plan. And I think very importantly, find those mentors, find those people that are a little bit further down the road. And then in some cases, much further down the road that we can use as a sounding board and they can help us kind of plot a course and develop a, a strategic plan. And so that's probably first two or three years in your a new environment. I also think it's important, and I, I tell this when I work with young people, give yourself some grace in that time. 
you're going to make mistakes. You're in a new environment. You don't know what how the company works, how the organization works. And so it's very important to be forgiving with ourselves. Oftentimes, uh, we're harder on ourselves than anybody else. Then the next part of that career after you transition and you really found your home, that's where you really want to start to execute that plan. Um, I believe, um, I think it was in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said it first, Franklin Covey's book, um, start with the end in mind. So you've established this plan, you know where you're trying to get to, and now it's time to start to execute. It's time to start to really hit those objectives, whatever they are, making those uh, networks, and really buying into the organization um, for for whatever their objectives are, you want to be seen as that person that can really get there. And so in my time in the Navy, that's kind of how I took it. It's easy for us in the Navy. Um, your first rank in military branches, you are you're an, what we call one, and you're an O one for two years. And kind of the joke is you're there to make mistakes and you're allowed to do silly things. You have a special insignia that we call butter bars, and it, everybody knows you're going to make mistakes. And then after that, you start to get a little bit more senior and we start to have more expectations of you. And I think that um, as I've mentored people in other communities, kind of a similar thing. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mac. Uh, Michelle? Uh, first, thank you very much both for your service. Uh, it's one of my regrets that I didn't go into the military, at least for some time. And I'm always very appreciative of the fact that you both put your life on the line. You're putting your life on the line uh, in defense of our freedoms. And thank you very, very much. Um, I could, uh, divide my career, uh, it has literally been divided in, in, in two steps because, you know, I spent the first 30 years of my career since I was five, uh, <laughs> as a journalist, <laughs> full-time journalist. And when you're a journalist, you're an observer by definition. And at some point I decided I wanted to be a doer. And so you, you have to make that transition and it's hard because the, the path of least resistance is to continue what you are doing, especially because you've worked so hard, you've figured it out. It takes a long time to figure out an organization, uh, an industry, where the levers of power are, how to pull them yourselves, how to affect change or get where you want to go. You've finally done it. And now you're going to have to do that all over again, even when you think you know a lot about it. So I, I hope during this panel to to tell you a little bit more about, you know, step one, it's the stage one and and what I learned during that process and then the, the transition and how hard transitions are and, and facing fear in transitions uh, and learning to be uh, relaxed and uh, show yourself some grace as you make mistakes, which I have done in the last several years as, as I make this transition um, and uh, and go from there and hopefully you know, you walk away with some meaningful things. I have, you know, two, three, maybe four things that I've learned over time that when I tell people about it, they, they walk away. Okay, okay, that's meaningful. And uh, hopefully we'll get, you'll get some of that today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so, again, I like to bound things, right? So, it, Mac, I'll come back to you. So, if you could go back to a younger version of yourself in between chapters one and two, what would you tell yourself and why? I think the number one rule would be to to be intentional. Um, you, you know, I think looking back, I wasted some time kind of um, not being as strategic as I could, not being as intentional as I could. Overall, I think I had a plan. And, and when you're in a career like the military, it gives you kind of a plan. But I th also think it's very important to define your own terms of success. If you find yourself in an organization over a long period of time and you're only playing to what the organization thinks is success, um, I think that could lead to a very hollow, empty feeling, especially, you know, some of us get into traps and we're making decisions that are um, contrary to the best interests of our family, contrary to the best interests of our of our own health. And so definitely make sure you're defining your own terms of success and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, I think those are the two pieces of advice that I would give myself as I transition. Michelle? Be a little more patient. Uh, you, um, TV journalism in particular is an industry that rewards maximalism. It rewards egos, uh, which is unfortunate. You're nodding your head, you know. 
Um, you know, the, here's the secret to people on television. Uh, every person on television has the same inner dynamic. Uh, they are at once both deeply, deeply insecure and yet have enormous egos at the same time. So the internal dialogue is always, they love me. They love me. They love me, right? Don't they love me? Please love me. God, I hope they love me. Right? And this is, this is constant, right? And so, and the more extreme those two poles are, unfortunately, the more successful you are on TV, right? So a lot of the downfalls that you've seen within our industry stem from that core. And it's a difficult trade-off because it's also what makes someone successful on TV. I mean, it's a really, the very first time I ever anchored, uh, it felt to me like the whole audience could see into my soul. It's very, you feel very exposed, uh, especially because in cable, you know, when I was five and I started in the business, um, <laughs> cable was brand new. You know, there was only there were only three channels on TV when I grew up, and the news was 22 minutes uh, out of 30 because you had commercials, and everything was very very scripted. But as you get into cable, and you know, you're doing 14 hours a day, and budgets are tight. So now, uh, and by the way, airtime is oxygen in TV, right? The more t the more you're on TV, oh, the happier you are. So now you're anchoring for two hours at a time. But I mean, you're doing it without a lot of scripts, at the, you know, without scripts often, and you're doing live interviews and you're, you're ad-libbing. And so you must be your very authentic self on television. Um, and so, where's I going with this? I don't remember. But um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you were going to, you're going to make mistakes. And I started out, you know, trying to be, I think, too big for my britches without learning the ropes a little bit more and taking a breath and being more patient with myself to make those mistakes and make fewer mistakes by listening and observing more before acting. Thank you for that. Um, and obviously, as you start looking at, uh, remember how we framed it at the beginning, where we really want to be able to, you know, uh, have a session where hopefully the audience is able to extract principles between two completely different worlds and how they are able to navigate. I'll share with you since, since we're, you know, just a bit of a segue and we have the military theme. The military is very prescriptive with regards to what Mac was talking about. And I assume in your world, it was the same way. It's very prescriptive in terms of your station, if you will, with, within the station, the bigger station. Um, and so one of the things that the military is famous for is to be able to assign very prescriptive rules to a supervisor and then a senior raider, right? And the thought process there is that the person that you're interacting with daily that's observing you is not going to be your judge for your evaluation, which will dictate <clears throat> your promotion. And so the concept of having a senior rater is they're always a little bit distant. So the very point that Michelle was bringing up about, you know, you love me, you love me, you love me, right? right? That is something that's very familiar to Mac and I, that a lot of people spend time trying to make sure that you, you had love me, right, to make sure that I'm going to get a good grade to continue forward. And someone passed this along to me, and I think it's valuable, not just in the military circles, but for all of us, right, which is you gaining, having proximity and access to people is something you should not take for granted. And so the, the advice that was passed on to me was always understand that it is your duty to know and learn the job of two levels up. But whenever you're working, you should have you, the person in front of you, they should step aside and you should be able to take it. And again, in the military, it's easy because this could be a reality. Your, your, your immediate boss could cease to exist and somebody has to carry them. So it's a little more, you know, intentional, if you will. But I always thought that was a really good principle. And I followed it all my life. And as, as, as I got through, you know, the chapters that they're talking about, I realized how valuable that was because my peers didn't do that. My peers were a little more focused on making sure that Ed liked me, right? And not necessarily even thinking about what Ed's job is. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you liked me. So I always think that was unique. But shifting back to, to the panelists, I wanted to talk about the concept of, and a little bit about, you're talking about too big for your britches and understanding, um, the concept of volunteering in a career. And so oftentimes we, we get on a ladder for, for the big institutions or 
for all the social entrepreneurs, right? We're already too big for our britches to begin with, right? Because we're, sh- we're shooting for the sky, right? And so I like to start with Mac because, again, Mac was a, a White House fellow. And so I like to really start there and talk about how you ended up volunteering or deciding to apply or, you know, how that changed, you know, your world. Mac? Sure. So uh, I remember I had just graduated from college and a family friend had given me Colin Powell's biography, My American Journey. Colin Powell is an American statesman. Um, he was born to Jamaican immigrants in uh, Queens, I believe, uh, New York, went to a local city college in New York, um, great school, but not a especially famous or prestigious one. And he joined the military, joined the army, just like Frank, and was able to become the first um, person in charge of the entire United States military, all branches, four-star general, we call him the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was later um, appointed as Secretary of State. So just a remarkable American uh, hero. And I'm reading his book. And in the book, he had a chapter about the White House Fellows Program. I'd never heard about the White House Fellows Program, but it's a a one-year paid fellowship. Uh, It's generally early to mid-career. And we bring you to Washington and you work either in the White House or for a senior advisor at a cabinet secretary. An amazing opportunity to see how the federal government works at the absolute highest levels. And one of the best parts of the program is the education program, because twice a week, you're sitting down in a very small group off the record, which is key, having lunch with key leaders from business, from government, Supreme Court justices. And just like we're trying to do on this panel, you're able to kind of draw out some trends. How does this cabinet secretary um, succeed in life? with this really high impact demanding job as compared to this. um, I remember we went to New York and met with Jamie Diamond um, at the penthouse lunchroom looking over Manhattan. That was amazing. Um, And so you can kind of draw those trends. So that fellowship was, was very rewarding for me. The challenge was uh, I'm a career Navy officer. I've been working in ships my whole career and I got placed at the national economic council in the white house. And the way the fellowship starts, just a few weeks after the cycle, uh, I was given the, I'm a military guy, so like, you should be in charge of veterans portfolio. We want you to do education, entrepreneurship, and employment. I'm like, yeah, I'm active duty, but I don't know anything about veterans policy, but okay, I'll figure it out. And I'm at my first meeting, and they look at me and say, okay, um, President Obama's State of the Union is coming up. What are you putting in the State of the Union for veterans? I was like, man, I don't even know where the bathrooms are around here yet. Like, I, you know, what am I supposed to do? So um, I, I had to reach out to some mentors and, 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 and figure out how to work through that challenge. And what I also mentally learned was that, you know, when you're in those types of environments, it's very entrepreneurial. No one is grading your work. No one is telling you what to get done. You need to figure it out. You need to align yourself with the overall organization and, and start to make some progress. And so I got over that hurdle. But during this year, I found myself, like I alluded to earlier, I was working. It was a very rewarding job, but I was not, I didn't feel um, a f- sense of fulfillment personally. And I started to do some self-evaluation and I said, well, you know, when I'm in the Navy, when I'm in command, when I'm on the ship, I'm constantly interacting with my sailors. I'm constantly looking out for them and, and making sure that they're okay, making sure that their family or families are okay. But here in the White House, it wasn't like that. I was focused on myself. I was part of a larger team, but I had to deliver the products and and move on. And so what I started doing was finding time once a week to sit down with someone and and start to give back. And as I took that time out of my schedule, I was filled up and it was more rewarding and I was re-energized. And so it may be a bit paradoxical, but as I was giving that time up, I had much more energy to go on. And so I had volunteered and given back and, and and looked out for others before, but that's when I realized how important it was. We talk a lot about in the, these communities that we're in here at the festival about getting through the door and then holding the door open. But I think it's something more than that. It's actually about recharging our own batteries and making sure that we have the stamina to stay at these levels so that we can continue to kind of shine that beacon for others to follow us. And I think just very briefly, the other thing is we have to tell our stories. If Colin Powell hadn't written that, I would never found out about the White House Fellows Program. So I just encourage all of you to tell your stories um, at conferences, in your bios, online. A lot of times we want to be humble. I think that's one of the titles in this panel. And we should be humble, but we have to tell our stories. Wow. 
I have so many segues to go from, from Mac before we get to Michelle, but I'll, I'll probably start off with what I think is, is the most important one to just share with this group. Um, and, and I do, I do think that, you know, it does, does set the, the stage for the, the topic of the panel. And so when, when I was in that fellowship program, right, I'll come back to volunteering in a second. When I was in that fellowship program, um, I had, uh, there was an intern, an intern, I think with Susan Eisenhower, and that's, that's, you know, you get to, that's where you start off the program at Gettysburg. And uh, within the first couple of weeks, you know, your you're head spinning, you're doing a bunch of stuff. And the program director uh, called two of us and said, hey, listen, this intern somehow requested to talk to both of you. And she, I guess, just wants to meet you and get to know you. So I entertained a lunch, right? And, and she was, you know, she was young. She was 22 and her eyes were wide open. And she's like, you know, what can I be, you know, what can I be doing to build a relationship with you so we could continue this dialogue and the first thing i told her i said you know who are you mentoring she's 22 right and she her eyes opened wider and and she said i, I don't understand i'm just 22 i just graduated from college i said you're working for susan eisenhower you're latina okay whether you realize it or not there's a lot of young ladies that are looking at you right now so what can you do to benefit this relationship? Go find some mentees to make a difference, right? And I share that because I feel very passionate about that. And as I walk around the festival, you know, we, we all, like in humility, right? We, we never think of like that of ourselves, but there's a lot of people that are looking at all of us that are in this room right now. So I think that's the most important one, number one. Number two, coming back to the concept of volunteering, I do think that it's worth noting that I, although the fellowship is great, don't, you know, nothing against the fellowship, in the military, it is something of a risk to be able to volunteer to go here. And the reason why, there's a very strict timeline. And a lot of uh, mental athletes <laughs> that figure things out on how they're going to become a four-star admiral or four-star general don't want to take any risk to get off that path. And I would share with you, and most of you know that I'm a trustee at a university, and I work really hard to try to groom uh, alumni of the university to, to become more White House fellows. And I just had a huge disappointment with a super, I mean, just an incredible uh, American and military officer. I groomed him for almost four months. And in the process of the pipeline, it's a year long competition. He called me and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to apply. Right. And, and I remember thinking to myself, like, what? I've just invested four months of my life, you know, looking over your essays, giving you advice. And he's like, you know, I just met this other admiral and he told me that if I, if I take one year off, the military, I'm never going to become an admiral. And I just, I want to become an admiral. And I thought to my first thing, I thought to myself, well, I'm glad that it's obvious that you, you don't need to be a White House fellow, right? Because you, you think very small, right? But more importantly, I thought to myself, you know, it, it was a reminder of the risk to be able that we all have to take to put ourselves in places that are not comfortable, right? And I'm coming back to you, Michelle, for a second here. No and, rush for and, me. And, and lastly, since, since we're on this theme, the least important thing is I wanted to share a story with you guys that, you know, and Tati that's here, right, always re reminds me of these, in, these important uh, matters, right? And so we all have been, I'm sure all of us have transitioned in our careers and our understanding over time. And Chris is back there with the Obama administration, so he's probably going get, to get a kick out of this one as well. But so I'm in the program, in the fellowship program, two months into it, and the director calls me and says, hey, listen, you know, somehow your name came into a small circle and there's four of you that need to interview because President Obama wants to do a first time ever veterans address in Spanish. And you're one of the four contenders, right? And so I was like, you know, I'm competitive. So I went through the competition cycle. I get selected. They're like, you're the guy. And then I start battling with myself that thing. I start battling with myself because I'm like, I've been a big believer up to this point that, you know, and, and I'm going to open up because this is what the festival is all about. Right. And so, my, you know, my, my parents never spoke English. You know, I, I was raised, you know, on, you know, government assistance. The, the, you know, you can imagine all, all of that. Right? But I've been able to, you know, it's a great country and I've been able to navigate as best as possible. And I've been very, a very firm believer at that up to that point that I was like, you know, by, by doing it in Spanish, we're, we're creating as a double standard and we're making it easy for people to never learn English. But then I had a lot of reflection on, and you know, we hadn't met yet, Dati, but you know, I, I think that we're kindred spirits in that, in that regard. I had a lot of reflection on my own parents and I'm sad to share with you guys that I don't think my parents ever understood what I was able to do in the military. So in other words, I came in as a private, became a sergeant, and then my career took off. But to them, I was always the young boy in the neighborhood that joined the army instead of going to college and never came back. 
And I thought about them, and I thought about how many people we could reach, you know, by, by doing that. And I was able to do it, and it's been one of the things that I contemplate all, all the time in terms of being able to reach. And, and I have more, sh- more stories like this to, to share with you that I will definitely share with Tatiana and Francisco, but, but I would love to share them all with you when, when we have a little bit more time. Let me come back to Michelle. Um, so volunteering, right? You're a rock star, you know, in the financial sector, right? The last question I think is going to be super important for you. But in this one, where do you decide to volunteer to put yourself in the corporate governance space? And I, I want to say, I want to remind everybody, I met her at Ballet Hispanico where she's the chairwoman of the, so she, she's leading it, right? From a completely different space at a, you know, at a very young age, you started at five. So how did you decide to go into corporate governance and how did you crack something that is perceived to be very difficult as a woman of color? When I started covering Wall Street, um, there were basically three paths, right? And I was shocked to discover this. Here I am, this human American girl from New Hampshire, and I, I get to CNBC and we're covering Wall Street, and I discover that uh, this is about... This now, a little more than 20 years ago, so not that long ago, uh, if you were Roman Catholic, you went to Merrill Lynch. That means you were Italian or Irish. If you were Jewish, you went to Goldman Sachs or Bear Stearns. And if you were a WASP, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you went to J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley. I was shocked at these divisions. I just thought all these guys were white. <laughs> <laughs> what did I know? Um, and what did you notice? Where do black people go? Where do Latino people go? Uh, I get invited to speak, being the only Latina at CNBC at this point, I get invited to speak at the Dominicans on Wall Street. There were 10 of them. This is an industry that employs hundreds of thousands of people in New York City, right? And they're very excited because they think the first Dominican on Wall Street is there. He's 50 years old. And he had started out in the basement uh, back when printers had the, the dot matrix printers that had the stuff on the side. Yeah, uh, people of a certain age are all nodding their head, yeah. And he, they called it the chit room. I had to take the chit off the, off the paper, right? He was joking. Uh, and then he started bringing coffee to uh, the guys who were on the trading desk. And they noticed he was a bright guy. So they started letting him trade. And he became the first guy, Dominican trader on Wall Street. Uh, and one thing about Wall Street is, yes, at the time, very white, but also a meritocracy in a way that is brutal. You're running a trading desk. If you lose money, you get fired. If you make money, they don't care what color you are. You could be purple, right? So it was a path that if you could crack that code, you could get in. So I was very interested in trying to figure out how to crack that code for other people. And then as I started to observe, okay, why aren't there more uh, Latinas, Blacks, and leadership positions over the years? And I started to observe the following, which is that I think a lot of us either self-select or we are channeled towards human resources, marketing. Uh, And the real power lies in managing a P&L, a profit and loss statement. Are you a cost center or are you a revenue generator? I am not dumping on human resources. Human resources should actually be a very strategic position, especially in this day and age when human capital is so important. But that hasn't happened yet, right? So if you want to be a CEO, if you want to make it in the, in, in the corporate boardroom, you should be working towards that and not letting yourself be pushed. If that, By the way, if you decide you want to do human resources because that's what you want, that's great. And I would also say to all the women out here uh, who are here that if you decide that you don't want to work and you want to stay home with kids, that is a great decision. You should not feel guilty about that, right? But if we're going to get ahead, we've got to make the right career choices early. Uh, and so don't let yourself get steered if that's not what you want or listen to that. Um, you know, I, I hear young people say, oh, I really like people, so I'm going to go into human resources. When you're in human resources, you're working for the company, not for the people, right? You know, we jokingly said behind closed doors, but 
different places that I worked. Human resources, neither human nor resourceful. Uh, which is really mean, right? But it's just it was it was more you know you're working you're you're working for the the corporation, not necessarily uh, for the employees. So um, so anyhow, those are some of the lessons that that I, that I learned over time. And then as I as I, I went through this, I realized okay, I also want to be on the decision making side. And that's when I got I started getting approached about boards when I was at CNBC. It's like I've never managed a PNL. You know, not since the college newspaper. Why, why are you asking me to do this? And they said, well, first of all, you know, we have lots of politicians and professors on boards, and none of them know anything about business. They can't even read financial statements. You know a lot about business. You can read financial statements. You're way ahead of the game, and I can tell by what you do on TV that you show great judgment. Uh, and so that's what led me to believe that I could make the transition. But there were people who were very intentional about, about helping me make that transition and identifying me uh, as someone who could make that transition, right? So always look for your mentors. Always, always listen. Um, and, uh, well, that's Thank my... you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be shifting to uh, Q&A here. Uh, but, but before we do, I just wanted to make sure that I ring this bell, right? Pentagon Tours, Mac, you know, LinkedIn with him. <laughs> <laughs> Wall Street Tours, NBC Tours, <laughs> Michelle. Uh, um, please, uh, let's hear some questions from the audience. Yes, you reached out to me in Wova. Hello, hello. What, what year? Uh, 2004. Oh my God, you're so young. Yeah, <laughs> 91. <laughs> um, so great to see you. Thanks so much. Um, my question to you. Um, Yeah. Two, how do you navigate the esoteric kind of mystical pathway to a corporate place? What does that mean? Yeah. So, so when you're in journalism, you're almost you're never going to manage. You know, those opportunities don't arise. You're going to have to make a transition from what they call editorial to the business side. Right. Okay. So, you, so you know, right? Um, I'm just I, I just I interacted for so long and still do to this day with so many people in the business world you know, asking lots of questions. So that's where I, I, I discover, okay, there's this, this channeling that happens. Um, I, I don't even know if it's intentional. I, I really don't sometimes. It's just some implicit something that happens, right? Um, getting on corporate board, there's two things. Number one, having financial knowledge. Um, you really, if you haven't taken, if you aren't dealing with a P&L, Go take a basic accounting course so you understand income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements, and how they all work together so you can at least walk the walk and talk the talk, because that's a lot of what you do in, in a corporate board. Um, getting on corporate boards is also about who you know. Uh, so you need to be in the game all the time. I would say that, where do you live? What's the most important nonprofit in your city? Who's on that board? Go get involved with that nonprofit. Uh, because then you'll meet often the most important people in a city are on the most important nonprofits in the city. And then you will interact with them and they will know you. And that is important. Um, being on a nonprofit board is helpful. I, I got approached about joining the board of the Ballet Hispanico more than 20 years ago. I had no idea what a board was. I called up um, a very senior Cuban uh, guy that I knew on Wall Street. I said, they want me to join a board. What does that mean? He says, is it a for-profit or a non-profit? And it's a non-profit. He says, okay, understand this. On for-profit boards, you get paid. On non-profit boards, you pay. When you join a non-profit board, it generally costs you money. It doesn't always. It could also cost you time. But if you want to join the board of the Metropolitan Opera to sit at the table is 250 grand a year minimum, and then you have to buy tables at their galas, right? That's why you don't see a lot of minorities on, on big nonprofit boards, right? Because we haven't necessarily broken through to the ultra wealthy yet in mass, but we will. Um, <laughs> but there are smaller nonprofit boards, right? And you can still get involved in important nonprofits without joining the board. There are smaller nonprofit boards that will take your time rather than your money if you can add capacity. I highly recommend you do that because that's how I learned board structure. There's an audit committee. There's a nom-gov, nominating governance committee, 
understanding how it works, how they interact together, how to behave in a boardroom. What, you know, those are, those are, uh, things that, that are super important so you can walk the walk and talk the talk. Years ago, I read Vernon Jordan's book, uh, Vernon Can Read. Vernon was first black Americans to get on a corporate board. And he talks about, he had never, he had no idea what it was. And he gets to the, and he waits and he just watches. What does everybody else do? Right? Learn by watching. Uh, that's a great book, by the way. It comes from the fact that he, um, was a driver for a very wealthy t guy in town while he was in college and he was sitting, the guy would take a nap in the afternoon because he was elderly and he would sit in the library and the guy comes downstairs and looks at Vernon and says, Vernon, what are you doing? He says, I'm reading a book. He says, you can read? And he spends the rest of the day taking Vernon, his driver, volunteer, you know, paid driver, to different places. Did you know Vernon can read? Uh, so it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I highly recommend it. He passed away uh, in the last year. Uh, yeah, we have time for one more question. Sorry, I took two. You two are friends. Do them quickly, Frank. Do them quickly. We have time for two more questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, <clears throat> I think there are a few and they've changed over time. But I think right now what I'm most um, driven by is, um, you know, an acknowledgement of the people that have gone before me and the sacrifices they've made to get me here. Um, my grandfather passed away very recently and he is just a huge figure in my life. Um, my my mother was a 16 year old. I came home to my grandparents' home, and they raised me the first decade of my life. Um, and so, to that's what really drives me is giving back to to those people that have allowed me uh, to be sitting here with you here in Rio. I'm intensely competitive. I was born that way. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, since I was five. <laughs> But also, uh, I think a lot about my dad. Uh, you know, what would my dad want me to do uh, when he dropped me off uh, at college? He had gone to what was called a commuter school where he lived at home and then took the subway to school. And when he dropped me off, he said, wow, I wish my grandfather could see that I, my daughter was going to a sleepaway college. You know, and so to be the next generation that succeeds and then help the ones who come behind me to take an even bigger step forward, you know. Thank you. Trina? I want to say thank you all for your time. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. One, what are you reading? And two, you talked about, um, Michelle, particularly, you talked about identify your career path early, but what about those of us who are mid-career? Any thoughts you all have for us? And I'm You're, sorry, can you add okay. to that? And what about those that don't have mentors? Part of her question. Those who don't have mentors. You want, uh, so I, I bet you do have mentors. Maybe they're not officially mentors, maybe, but you can watch. Uh, you can learn a lot from people that you admire within your organization and industry. Uh, if you don't have a mentor, be aggressive about reaching out, saying, can I take you to lunch, et cetera. Um, but just observing who you admire, I have found over time is extremely helpful. What am I reading? I read like crazy. We, uh, you know, I have ink in my blood. I started in print. I was in my high school paper, my college paper. My first internship was I did layout of the Tampa Tribune physical, like laid out page. Um, so we have five physical newspapers that arrive every day. Uh, at, at my apartment, um, but I, what am I reading? I'm reading a book right now about uh, Henry Wallace, who was FDR's vice president uh, until they knew that FDR was going to die the next time he got elected, and they thought Henry Wallace wouldn't be a good president, so they switched him out. Uh, and what would have, what would the world have been if Henry Wallace had been uh, uh, president of the United States? It's a very interesting, you know, exercise. Um, so those are the kinds of things I read. Uh, and then constantly I read all kinds of foreign policy things that come across my desk. Um, and you had another quick question, so I'm talking too long. Mid-career, mid mid don't be afraid of change. 
it's really hard. I mean, it's just so, so difficult to, to get off the path that you're on. Um, but especially right now when unemployment is as low as, as it is, uh, you have way more transferable skill sets than you can imagine. And, and don't think that because you're on a path, you can't take all those skill sets and repurpose them to something else. And we're at a moment where people are very willing to listen to that and, and to, to see that. So don't be afraid. Life is, life is, there's a lot of things to be afraid of, you know, cancer. But career change is not it. Matt, can you bring us home? Uh, so you, the first question is what I Self-permission to read a novel while I'm here. Uh, so I'm taking a little downtime. I'm reading The Noble House, which I've read several times over the years. It's just it's just Noble House, James Clavell. It's great fun. Um, but the book I always recommend is The One Minute Manager. I love it because it's very short. And if you lead people or aspire to leading people, I think it's mandatory reading. And you can get through it in a short flight. It's very short, um, very helpful in my opinion. I, I just really want to emphasize some of the things Michelle said. You know, coming to a festival like this, don't forget the ability to cold call. Hey, I saw you at the festival. Uh, I know you know Cordell. Can I take you to lunch? Um, and create those relationships because some, you know, anybody that's ever worked in sales, you know, the cold call is very intimidating. You don't want to be rejected, but um, you have to do it. And we've all just spent the last hour talking about the importance of giving back. So I think they'll be, you'll be pushing on a lot of open doors. So, I'd like to ask everybody to give you a round of applause for our panelists. This is the first time that they come to the festival. I'm trying to proselytize and make them ambassadors of our festival. And Done. We'd love to. Thank you all Thank for you. attending. Thank you.